So now we will introduce Carnot Maps. Carnot Maps is going to be our primary tool for minimizing our Boolean functions. A Carnot Map is a function table in matrix form with at most two variables per dimension. And the input combinations are listed in this table as gray code. And since the input combinations are listed as gray code, this means that between two consecutive positions in our table, both horizontal or vertical, there is only one change in a variable for these two positions. The Canon map can be seen as a graphical interpretation of our n-dimensional Boolean space. The maps are useful on paper where we have two dimensions and we can do this easily for functions of two, three or four variables. It is also possible and we will see an example of it when we have five variables and it is possible although quite difficult to do this also for six variables but for more than six variables we cannot use our Carnot maps. And the reason that it is easy to do for two, three or four variables is that a paper has these two dimensions. It is very easy to graphically write two dimensions on a piece of paper. And since we can have at most two variables per dimension, it means that we can do it up to four variables. For these five variables and six variables here, we need to think three dimensionally. We can do that, but it is a little bit more difficult. So if we look at how our Cano maps are written. We first do this for a function of two variables. So in each dimension we could have at most two variables, but here we only have one variable in each dimension. So we call these variables x1 and x2. And then x1 can take on the value 0, we can take on the value 1. Similarly for x2 we can take on the value 0 and we can also take on the value 1. And then in this part of the table we write the result of the function when we have an input that is zero. So when x is zero, x1 is zero, and x2 is zero, then we will have the output f of zero. And similarly for f of one and f of two, where we have x1 is a one and x2 is a zero, and f of three, where both input variable takes the value one. And what we do here is that we enumerate the different rows and our different columns. We can only have one change in variables when we go from one row to another one. So here we only change because we only have one variable. Obviously, we can only have one change in a variable because we go from zero to one. Three variables is a little bit more interesting because now we can utilize that in this dimension here we can write two variables to so both x2 and x3 and in the other dimension of our matrix we have one variable. So note here now that when we enumerate our different entries in our Carnot map when we go from one column to the next we are only changing one variable. So here, instead of having the NBCD coding, where we would have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, we instead have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, and 1, 0. And also when we go from the last column back to the first column, we will also have a change in only one variable. And again, since we have three variables, we only have one variable in the other dimension. So here, obviously, we will only have a change in one variable. So note now, how we are putting our values into this matrix. So first we have F0, F1, and then, then we need to jump over one to get F2 because F2 here would be this zero and the value that we have here, one zero. So zero, one, zero, if we count it as X1, X2, X3. So this will be F of two. And then F of three will be written here instead. And then similarly for the last row, we have f of 4, f of 5, then f of 6 in the last column, and f of 7 in the second last column instead. And if you want, you can instead have two variables here for this dimension, and then one variable x3 for the other dimension. Which one you choose is just up to you and a matter of taste. They both work equally well. And here you would just put f0, f1, 
two, three, and then jump to the last row for four and five, and then you go back to the second last row for six and seven, because you have one, one here, because of our gray coding in this dimension here. And remember that the gray coding has to be cyclic. So there is only one variable change from the last row to the first row here as well. Four variables is as far as we can go with two dimensions because we can have at most two variables in each dimension. So here we have x1 and x2 in this dimension and x3 and x4 in this dimension. And again, we have a gray coding for both of our dimensions. So here we're utilizing that we have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, and 1, 0, and then of course a gray coding back to the first row. And similarly for the columns that we have. And here what we see is that when we put our values into our Carnot map, we have f of 0, f of 1, then we jump over in the next one to have f of 2, and then we go back to f of 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, and then we go to the last row to get 8, 9, 10, and 11, and we go back to the second last row because this has the 1, 1, where we have f of 12, 13, 14, and finally f of 15. And I think it is important here to note that the values that we have here in our function, like 11, 10, and so on, these are the NBCD coding of our input combinations. So x1, x2, x3, and x4. But the enumeration of the inputs here in our table or in our Carnot maps, they are gray coded. So how can we take advantage of these Carnot maps? Well, we do it for minimization. So in a Carnot map, a cube that we have seen before is a rectangular block that covers two to the k positions. And this rectangular block can be cyclic because we have gray coding also from the last to the first column and row. And note that we need to make rec rectangular blocks of two to the k positions. So we can have rectangular blocks covering one, two, four, eight, and in the trivial case, 16 positions if we have four variables. We cannot have any rectangular blocks for, for example, three or five or seven positions or something like that. So this is not okay. We need to have two to the k positions every time we make a rectangular block. So when we minimize our functions using Carnot maps, we do the following. So first, we find as big rectangular blocks as possible with two to the k positions that are either ones or in the don't care set. And these will represent our prime implicants. When we have found all our prime implicants, it is time to find the essential implicants that we have. That is, those prime implicants that need to be part of the function. And in the final step, we are going to choose a minimal number of the rest of the implicant, such that all the ones in the function are covered. And if we follow all these three steps, we will have a prime cover, which we wanted to have, because all our implicants are prime implicants, and we will also have what we call a minimal cover. because we use as few implicants as possible.